coming up on this episode. No, there's so much happening constantly around you and it's uh, of course very difficult to keep up even if it's your job to keep up with the latest technologies. And now we are at the stage where one actually can already buy quantum computers. Not in your local supermarket yet, but you, you can actually order a quantum computer from some companies. Hi, for this Future Here podcast episode, I had the opportunity to interview Mikael Johansson, the manager of quantum technologies at CSC IT Center for Science in Finland. So what is quantum computing again? Quantum computers can in theory perform certain operations and complete tasks far faster than traditional computers can, but they are still a long way from reaching their full potential. While a traditional computer uses binary bits to perform all its calculations, quantum computers use qubits that can be a zero, a one, or both at the same time. It's definitely a lot to wrap your head around, but Mikhail does a great job of describing how this actually works, both in theory and in practice. Mikael works at CSC on the research and development of a quantum computer called Helmi. If you happen to listen to the first Future Here podcast episode, you might already know that last winter Helmi was connected with Europe's fastest traditional supercomputer called Lumi. Together these instruments create the world's most powerful computational device. In the interview, we discuss, among other things, quantum computing, its future, current state and challenges, as well as Mikael's motivations for choosing this career path involving quantum computers. So without further ado, let's jump into the interview. Hi, welcome to the newest Future Here Show episode. Today I have Mikael Johansson as a guest. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, hi everyone. Uh... Yes, my name is Mikael Johansson, and uh, I work as manager for quantum technologies at CSC, the IT Center for Science here in Finland. First to kick off, could you please tell a bit about your background and how you became interested in science and technology? Well, I've probably been interested in science and technology since since already since a kid. So, 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 um, I think uh, my first experiences with uh, with technology was uh, uh, my cousin who had. Um, Big twenty computer and 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 uh, I was really excited to learn learn how to program that one because um, I rented some books in the library on on how to program computers and and then how to really get computers to do what you wanted and and uh, or at least uh, some something uh, cool and 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 then it was always very exciting to go and uh, play with that computer and try to program it uh, already as a as a kid and uh, I think that's where the seed to really being interested in technology and then later science came and and of course then i would say through science fiction novels and and movies uh, have always inspired me as well and these days in a way i think i'm almost living in a science fiction world even if it is reality it does seem like that doesn't it and, and have you noticed that it really seems like we're getting into this exponential curve of all technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's so much happening constantly around you, and it's uh, of course very difficult to keep up, even if it's your job to keep up with the latest technologies. So, so there's uh, really lots, lots happening, and it, uh, I find it exciting, uh, even if, even if there are of course some concerns about the rise of technology and and uh, let's say artificial intelligence that has been much talked about lately. But um, I would see it more as an opportunity and an excite, exciting road towards the future. Yeah, great. And what about your current role then? What is it like? Well, uh, now I'm uh, working, as I said, here at the CSC, and um, one of our traditional duties has been to provide high-performance computing services to the uh, Finnish researchers, so supercomputing power. And uh, we are now looking into also expanding this and looking towards the future of, of how to develop supercomputers and uh, and supercomputing services. And uh, one very intriguing uh, aspect here is uh, quantum computers, the topic of today. And uh, we really see that as a potentially speeding up supercomputing significantly in the future. And and uh, my role here is to, to enable the uptake of quantum technologies in general, but quantum computing also in particular among our users. 
And how did you personally become interested in quantum computing specifically then? Uh, well, I was actually a researcher at the university before studying uh, quantum mechanical effects in in chemical and biochemical systems. And um, then I went to this uh, startup uh, event slush here in Helsinki and um, heard a lecture by uh, by Jan Goetz, who, who I later learned was the, the co-founder of, of a quantum computing company here in Finland, IQM. Uh, and he just uh, happened to mention that one of the first killer applications of quantum computing uh, would probably be chemistry and quantum chemistry, which was what I was involved in. And, and then that really started intriguing me. And oh, that sounds actually very exciting. And then I started looking into it more. And then it just so happened that uh, CSE was also uh, expanding even more into quantum computing than before. And, and then we're looking for more people to join the work here. And uh, after some hesitation that I overcame, uh, mainly due to the help of my wife, who said, yes, you can leave the university. One doesn't have to stay there forever if you find something more exciting. So so then I jumped over here. And, and that's that's how my career in quantum computing uh, here at CSE started. It's now a bit over three years ago. Sounds like a good jump then, and that you moved here. Well, could you then explain quantum computing briefly on a general level? Yes. So quantum computing is um, a completely new way of doing computations compared to to how we are used to doing them with classical computers, either laptops or supercomputers or whatever. So um, quantum computers exploit uh, a few quantum mechanical phenomena to do the calculations, uh, like superposition and and um, entanglement and wave function phase and so forth. We might talk about those later a bit more. But um, the idea is anyway that uh, it really exploits a type of physics that uh, classical computers want to avoid as much as possible. And um, by exploiting this uh, phenomena, then one really can speed up certain types of calculations very much because it uh, really enables a new type of calculations that you just cannot perform on, on classical computers. And uh, that's the basic idea, that uh, it's a device for performing computations in a completely new manner. And uh, used correctly, this can then really lead to some really exciting results. In terms of this being a theoretical idea to on the other end of the axis, it being practically already in implementation, where would you describe that we are at current? This all started some 40 years ago at the break of the 70s and 80s, uh, when there was three guys uh, rather independently and simultaneously came up with uh, with uh, this idea of quantum computers, uh, uh, Paul Benny of Yuri Manin and, and uh, Richard Feynman. And uh, the real realization came from this that the they they saw that some types of calculations are really difficult for classical computers. And uh, these types of calculations was really simulating quantum systems. Uh, and for me personally, that would then, for example, mean quantum chemistry and, and looking at how molecules behave and how molecules interact and how drug molecules interact in the body and how, well, material science, where, where we try to figure out how solar cells work and all of this. So simulating this uh, is it's of course a big business and and a big science in itself already now but uh, it is very demanding uh, if we look at how much computer power it needs and uh, these three guys then realized that this is actually always going to be highly demanding for classical computers so i can only expect like some small incremental gains in inefficiency there and that to really study this quantum mechanical systems, one would need a completely new type of computer. And then they came up with this theoretical idea of quantum computer and, and uh, formulated some ideas of, of how that one could look like and how it would perform and and then well, what it could do. And uh, So it's now 40 years since one came up with the idea and now we are at the stage where one actually can already buy quantum computers. Not in your local supermarket yet, but you, you can actually order a quantum computer from some companies and and uh, really get it delivered either to your house if you want. But 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 of course, uh, for the moment, um, many of the clients are HPC centers li- like we are, and um, so there has been a steady progress. And uh, it, maybe first 
from being an idea, it took some time and, and uh, people started thinking of what it could be useful for. And, and, uh, but then, uh, one actually came up with some concrete algorithms or programs that one could run on these theoretical machines and, and then show that, yeah, actually some problems they really could solve in, in uh, a much more efficient manner than, than classical computers. And then one started thinking of how to construct these and, and then over the years, one just made more and more complex and more efficient quantum computers. And 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 uh, now we are at the stage where I would say we are still at a very early stage, but they are now real devices and not just uh, some dreams in 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 uh, physicists' heads. And delving then into the the workings or the mechanics of quantum computers, then the superposition. Uh, as you mentioned, is a very core part of it, right? Could you please explain what the superposition is? Yeah, yeah. So if we first think of, of how a classical computer works, so inside the computer we only have bits that are zeros or ones, and that, that's how a classical computer works. So it it, it contains the memory is full of zeros and ones, and 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 then the uh, computer uses this information to to perform some calculations and so forth and um, so if you actually think of what the what the standard computer program is so uh, it's in principle just a recipe of uh, which bits to flip uh, so to say uh, so change the value from zero to one or one to zero and when to do it because all that happens in a computer is that the zeros becomes ones and ones becomes zeros at some point in time Utilizing physical transistors that yes. used to be about the size of a light bulb, now to being fifteen billion transistors on a on a solid state microchip, but basically just kind of physical things either being on or off, yes. then causing the the binary of of that being zero. Yes, yes, uh, and then the computer program just controls when these transistors transistors flitch and. And then change the values of of, of the bits in memory. O- okay, so the basic information unit for classical computers is is the bit that can be have the, then this binary two values. But um, a quantum computer then works with quantum bits, qubits, and uh, these qubits. So they have this powerful and peculiar feature that uh, they can be zero or one, just like normal bits, but they can also be anything in between at the same time. And uh, this is uh, the superposition that, uh, that you really can have two different states at the same time. So the value can be both zero and one or some portion of zero and some portion of one. And uh, if you actually think of of, um, of the state or the value of a qubit, then we can think of a sphere, a ball, for example, the earth. And uh, a normal bit, a classical bit, so when it has two values, zero, one, so that could be represented as being either the North Pole or the South Pole. So there's two two distinct places it can be, two states that it can be in. But uh, the value of a qubit can then be any point on the surface of this sphere, any point, for example, on, on the globe. Uh, and uh, this, I think, uh, if, if you think of it, what this means, so, so a qubit can really have an infinite amount of different values. Or, or the state that it represents can be in an infinite amount of different points. So that that somehow already shows how much more information in principle you can have in a qubit compared to a normal bit. It's then, of course, a different question of how to actually utilize this. But but um, the superposition really means uh, if we visually think of it, so 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 that we we go away from this uh, limited capability of just being at the North Pole and the South Pole. To being anyway anywhere on the surface of the entire Earth, uh, so so th- that's what the superposition represents. So it, it's some mixture of of North Pole and South Pole and everything in between. And then the reason that it's also a globe and not just a straight line is, is that we have this wave function phase then that we also include there. But it just adds another dimension uh, to the uh, to the information content that that the qubit contains. Um, so this superposition is then utilized and has to be utilized when you actually do the computations um, on a quantum computer. And uh, so it becomes much more powerful. But at the same time, it, of course, becomes much more complex and much more difficult because uh, 
as said, so a standard computer program is rather simple in, in what it does at the basic level. So it just switches zeros to ones and ones to zeros. So that's rather simple conceptually also to think of what happens, but a quantum computer really has to change the state of this basic information units, the qubits, all around the surface of a sphere. And that's, of course, much more difficult to just program and even think of conceptually yourself. And and, and. so it becomes uh, an interesting problem in itself just to, to even think of what one information unit in a quantum computer is. But it's a qubit and it's in a superposition or can be in a superposition. That's really fascinating. And then additionally, there's the so-called observer theory, where actually the observer, either human subject or some kind of measuring equipment actually alters or maybe just forces that superposition to become in an absolute position. Could you please yes, discuss yes, this? Exactly. So as I said, so the qubit can be in whatever state there on this or a point on the on the surface of the sphere and and the superposition of zero and one and everything in between. But when you actually measure it or observe it, as you say, uh, and want to know uh, the value of the qubit, then it will always give you either zero or one. So the quantum state, uh, the superposition state, is lost when you actually want to read out the information. So if you think of a normal computer, where you want to print out the value of some variable in this state, in this case, then just a qubit. So they will not get 0 0.7 or 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. You will either get 1 or 0. So that way, then, when you read out the values, it behaves exactly like a, a standard binary computer. So there's only two, two possibilities of which value you get. But the, the answer depends on, on the state of the qubit. So the probability of which one you measure uh, depends on where exactly you happen to be on the surface of uh, this sphere that represents the qubit. Uh, so it also means that that you don't really know what answer you will get from the quantum computer. So it's a probabilistic by nature, as um, opposed to deterministic as a classical computer is. So, so which of course also has to then be considered when you program them and think of what they should compute. But but yeah, yes, indeed. So this is this is really central to the to the functioning of a quantum computer. So. While the computation is happening, then then these qubits can be in whatever state between zero and one. And but uh, when the calculation is finished, or when you read out the result, then you force the result to be either zero or one for every qubit. And this has to be considered. So, so you you cannot just use it to get uh, out directly in a direct manner uh, some uh, more complex numbers than than zero or one. It's fascinating, and it's so mind-boggling of, of why that actually happens. Could you explain how does one process information differently with qubits to classical computers and their bits? Yeah, so no, as mentioned, so bits are the basic information units of classical computers and qubits uh, for quantum computers. And uh, bits uh, contain some amount of information in these bit strings. So, if, for example, if you have two bits, then you can have four different uh, alternatives. So you can have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Uh, and this can, for example, represent an input to a computer program. So so, so you have a program and then you input, okay, what happens if I enter the number 0, 0, and 1, 0, and, and so forth. And uh, for when you have two bits, so then I said you have four alternatives, so to see what the program does, you have to run the calculation four times, uh, each for these four different values. But uh, in a quantum computer with qubits, when they are in superposition, so they can be zero and one at the same time, it means that you can actually enter all of these numbers in one go. So with two qubits, you can have a superposition of zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one in one go and have that as an input to your program. So you can calculate what happens with all of these four values at the same time. Uh, and when you have three bits, then you actually already have eight uh, different um, possibilities of, of, well, constructing zeros and ones together. And in a quantum computer, you can then run eight calculations in principle at the same time. Uh, and this just increases when you have more bits and, and qubits and compare this. So for 
20 bits, you actually can construct uh, a million different combinations. Uh, and uh, if you want, want to, in a classical computer, know what happens with all of these inputs, then you have to run the calculation a million times, uh, once for each input. But in a quantum computer, again, you can run these million different possibilities at once by just creating a superposition of all of these million states. So it, it really becomes much more efficient in, in uh, extracting information out of your input. But of course, this requires that you have a program that does something useful with it. And, and, and these programs then uh, are not that easy to construct. And, and that's one of the big challenges and also to find out what you want to compute. But, uh, but in principle, uh, the parallelism of a quantum computer really comes from this capability of, of uh, handling many inputs at the same time. So you don't need to do separate calculations like with a classical computer. You just do one massive calculation on a quantum computer. Super interesting. And we'll get back to into how you see the future of quantum computing progressing. But could you first describe what the Helmi quantum computer is? Yeah, well, the Helmi quantum computers, that's uh, the first Finnish quantum computer built in, built in Finland. And um, it's uh, built um, together by VTT, the State Research Center in Finland, and uh, IQM quantum computers, a startup that, that uh, spinned off from Aalto University and, and VTT. And uh, they have together built Helmi, and uh, it's a, for the moment, it's a five qubit quantum computer, and a 20 qubit version should come out any day now soon. And it's based um, on superconducting technology. So these qubits, as I talk, talked about, so they have to be just like the transistors made out of something and, and physically at the physical level. So at the theoretical level, they are a sphere with values of anywhere at a point, but physically they have to be something. And in this superconducting quantum computer, so so, so it means that the, it's a superconducting circuit that 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 uh, implements the qubit and uh, it becomes superconducting only at very, very low temperatures. So actually it's a few millikelvins about, above absolute zero. So in, uh, well, in Celsius degrees, minus 273.15 and well, you can translate that to Fahrenheit, but later for, for, for the audience in, in different continents. But uh, anyway, if you think of Helmi, so yes, it is a working quantum computer, but it's in a way also a culmination of work that started a long, long time ago in Finland. So all of this uh, comes uh, from work on low temperature physics that started in the 1960s uh, in the cold laboratory of, of the Helsinki University of Technology, which is now Aalto University, and where one started the work on really studying physics at the lowest temperatures possible in the universe. And uh, then, of course, it was basic research, and, and it was much before the whole concept and idea of quantum computers even came up. So it had nothing to do with developing quantum computers, but, but uh, it was still needed to really come up with the technology for how to construct very efficient quantum computers based on this superconducting technology. So I think it's a very nice example of how one never knows where basic research takes you. So uh, without this research that started uh, sorry, then 60 years ago, we would not have Helmi. So it's one of the products. There's many, many other uh, excellent technological inventions that came out of of this cold, cold laboratory that is still going strong and and, and the research at at Alto and uh, I, I think it's just exciting this also to to see that now we are really seeing the fruits of of basic research in this particular case. That's really exciting and there's so many practical inventions in in other fields of tech as well, like the MRI machine that was invented partially because there was similar technology used for cosmology yeah, exactly. or, or yeah, space yeah. research. So it just proves how you never know what basic research will then be used for in practical applications, yes. right? And I think that's also one thing that is important to remember now in, in an age where one just wants practical applications immediately. So, so the one should maybe also think of this basic research, the necessity of basic research. Definitely. What kind of research projects are the teams utilizing the Helmi quantum computer for? 
Yeah, so Helmi has now been available for Finnish researchers for about half a year through the Lumi supercomputer. And uh, there are a few categories that uh, pop out uh, from from the from the lotto that are maybe more popular than others. And uh, one of them is uh, really studying error correction of quantum computers themselves. So quantum computers really have a problem in the, that um, they are rather error prone and, and at the prototype stage still. So they compute wrong a lot of times. And uh, But this can then be mitigated by, by software and, and certain algorithms. And uh, that's something that that is studied, studied intensively all around the world and also, also in Finland. And uh, for this one, needs access to a real quantum computer to really figure out how that one works and what makes that that special. And uh, because all the quantum computers are individuals at this stage still, so they all behave slightly differently. And uh, so th- that's one category. And uh, another interesting category would be quantum machine learning, where one combines quantum computing with classical machine learning or, or makes uh, completely new algorithms that uh, that perform machine learning u- using quantum algorithms. And uh, that's a rather intriguing field where where I, I expect that one can see lots of progress in in the in the near near future and uh the third category would probably be then education where one really wants to uh, just use a quantum computer to show students how a real quantum computer works and i think that's a really valuable in itself that that, that one gets a feel for how does a quantum computer differ from a standard computer and to really have a real device at hand in, in a classroom is, uh, I think it uh, probably motivates students to, to really see how things work for real. The Lumi supercomputer in Finland and the Helmi quantum computer form this hybrid computing device that actually currently is stated to have the world's most computational power. And on the Lumi website posted in, in 2020, it stated that Lumi will provide a convergence between quantum and classical computing. Please discuss this. Yeah, so uh, Lumi is uh, this pan-European supercomputer that uh, for the moment is the most powerful in Europe. Uh, and uh, it's uh, number three in, in the world on this uh, famous top 500 list of supercomputers and their power. And uh, it's uh, hosted by CSC in, in our data center in Kajani, but it's really a... Uh, a combined effort of the whole of Europe, so so all researchers in Europe can can use it freely. And uh, but yes, indeed. So so we have uh, combined uh, the Helmi quantum computer and the Lumi, as mentioned, and, and and one can access Helmi through Lumi, but one can also for, for perform these uh, hybrid calculations where one uses both classical computing and quantum computing in the same same workflow and program flow. And uh, that's actually uh, what quantum computers most likely will be used for in the future to accelerate high performance computing in general so uh, quantum computers uh, are very good at some things and uh, very efficient at solving some limited set of problems but they are actually not general purpose computers in the way that they are very inefficient at solving many other things and that means that when you have any sort of a real workflow or problem that you want to solve, uh, then much of that will always have to be computed on a supercomputer if it's a massive, massive problem. But uh, then the hope is that some parts of these most time-consuming parts could then be accelerated by quantum computers. But but yes, in practice, so, so this convergence uh, that you mentioned, so it just means that uh, in the future, high-performance computing systems will consist of both classical computers containing the CPUs and GPUs and who knows what other classical devices one still comes up with, neuromorphic computing or or something like this, uh, and quantum computing. So it becomes this really heterogeneous system where, where you use lots of different uh, processor types, so to say, uh, to solve some specific bigger problem. So you really mix and match uh, the best of all worlds that you have, have at your hand and uh, this is, um, I think, the way, way to go, and uh, I would say it's a natural way of, of just evolving also the supercomputing uh, infrastructure. Like uh, we are already saw the transition uh, from CPUs to these graphical processing units, and 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 uh, and both are still used depending on what one wants to calculate. And uh, now we 
just add quantum processing units, QPUs, to the mix as well. And by just, that's of course a, a crude simplification because it, there's uh, lots of work involved in getting this to actually work. But uh, the aim is anyway to, to in the future have these uh, hybrid systems where you really combine classical and quantum computing. What are currently the biggest challenges in quantum computing? Uh, that would definitely be the noise problem and um, the decoherence problem as well. So uh, quantum computers uh, need to maintain their quantum state uh, in order to perform a calculation. And uh, for the moment, uh, this can only be maintained for a very short time. Uh, we are talking microseconds. And uh, this means that uh, any calculations you have to do on the quantum computer have to finish before the computer crashes, because it is analogous to a computer crashing when the quantum state disappears. So, so when you don't have your superposition, it doesn't stay in superposition and, and your entanglements are lost and so forth. And all of these quantum effects that you are supposed to use in your quantum computer when they fade away uh, due to outside interference and so forth. So uh, that's a big technical challenge. And uh, that's also one reason why, for example, superconducting qubits have to be at really low temperatures to really minimize the interference from the outside world and so forth. And and uh, this is also related to the general concept of noise where uh, quantum computers are rather imprecise in their operations and uh, outside noise affects them and, and then also the actual operations that you do uh, with the qubits when you want to manipulate uh, them and, and, and change their state and uh, moving around the point on the sphere, so to say. So that's... Uh, not as precise as one would want, uh, actually quite far away from it. So, uh, for example, these days, operation fidelity, which means that the success rate of, of these manipulations is uh, considered to be state of the art if it's 99.9%, uh, which might sound like a rather high number, but if you think of it, what it means, it uh, means that it fails uh, once every thousand operations. And... Uh, if you would think that, uh, compare that to a classical computer, that would not work if uh, you know how many millions and billions and trillions of, uh, of calculations happens every second in your, uh, in your laptop. So if uh, every uh, one in a thousand operations would fail, the, the laptop would be useless. Uh, a classical computer would be useless with this high error rate. So one really has to increase this a lot. And that's also one of the, uh, one of the research projects that I mentioned. So it so, so tr tries to deal with this. And, 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 but it, it's really... It's both a software problem, but mostly it's still a hardware problem. So one just needs to construct more reliable quantum computers. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge. So it, it is the reliability of that. Uh, at the same time, one also needs to increase the qubit count and so forth. So for the moment, the, the largest general purpose quantum computer in the world is uh, constructed by IBM, IBM Osprey, that has 433 qubits. And it, it's a good start, but uh, we need orders of magnitude more to really tackle the really interesting and uh, high impact problems. In January this year, Wired wrote that quantum computing has a noise problem, like you mentioned. Uh, could you then explain what the NISQ is in practice? The NISQ or the NISQ, so that's uh, short for the uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum era that we are in. So it uh, refers to the capabilities and the features of the quantum computers of today. So they are noisy and they are intermediate scale in qubit count. Uh, and uh, that uh, was invented as, as opposed to these fault tolerant quantum, ideal quantum computers where every qubit would would work perfectly and and, and would stay coherent and the superposition and the quantum state would would uh, would stay for, for a long time, seconds, minutes, hours even. Uh, but uh, we are far away from that, so we are in this NISC era. So we have to deal with noise and we have to deal with the limited number of qubits. And uh, it really also makes uh, algorithm development and program development very different because you cannot now rely on just writing ideal programs that in principle mathematically should work if you have a perfect quantum computer. Because we don't have that perfect quantum computer and we will not have it for some time, uh, I dare say. And uh, so one needs to think already now of, of, of uh, how to program quantum computers taking this noise problem into account. 
Because if we don't take it into account, then we really have to wait for a long time before we have any use of the quantum computer. So you're saying that rather than kind of say that this is just a broken state of, of the computing, then understand that this is the nature of how yes. the physics works and then learning to work around that yeah. uh, I, characteristic. I, I, yeah, I, I think one needs to realize that the quantum computers, they are not computers in the classical sense, uh, pun both intended and not in a superposition way. Uh, but um, uh, quantum computers are more like physics experiments devices. So you actually perform an experiment on the quantum computer and then you measure the result of that experiment and uh, as opposed to just making a calculation that is perfectly predictable and, and deterministic. So, so it uh, also requires a rather new mindset for people who program then. So, and uh, I, I think that realization is kicking in now. So uh, of course, uh, everyone is hoping for this uh, fault tolerant era where, where quantum computers would be as reliable as your laptop. But, uh, but at the same time, one starts to realize that, okay, no, we really have to think about quantum computers as very different beasts to our supercomputers or, or phones or whatever. So, uh, and one, one has to just treat them as, uh, experimental devices or devices for experiment in this way. That's a good way of putting it. According to a 2022 article in phys.org, research at MIT and elsewhere are working to overcome this problem, the noise problem, by developing a technique that makes the quantum circuit itself resilient to noise. One framework is called quantum NAS or noise adaptive search. I know this isn't uh, research that you're currently working with, but can you can you address how you see this and other research teams tackling the the uh, noise problem? Yeah, so th- this is this is um, also another approach in in addition to try to do error correction or error mitigation. So. Uh, and it comes from the realization that, uh, well, first a quantum circuit, so that's just a program. A circuit means that 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 it's just represents what kind of basic commands, basic operations do you want to perform on the qubits there. So, so, so a quantum circuit is, is in principle a quantum program or the algorithm there. Uh, but uh, in a classical computer, again, so uh, one doesn't think of this of how do you perform the mathematical operations? You just tell the computer to do it, and it will do it. But uh, a quantum computer, when we have this noise problem, so it also means that, that uh, for example, all the qubits are slightly different. So when I mentioned that the fidelity or the reliability of a qubit might be 99.9%, uh, that might be the average, but then there might be some qubits in the device that are 98% and some that are even higher uh, than 99.9. And uh, so it also means that w- when you run a calculation, it depends on which qubits and in with what order do you use them. Uh, and this can be optimized. So of course you would want to mostly use those qubits that are, have a high probability of actually doing what you want them to do instead of using those that don't really want to, to <laughs> obey your orders. Uh, and also there's a difference in, in uh, what kind of basic operations do you want to perform for perform on them. So uh, one can make circuits or programs that are in principle mathematically equivalent, but do things in a slightly different order. So getting five from two pl- plus three instead of one plus four uh, or something like this. Uh, so, but depending on, on exactly how you implement it and what basic commands you use uh, because of the noise, the quantum computer will uh, give differently reliable results. And uh, this is something that one then can optimize and, and, and think of how do you actually want to optimize your circuit. And, and uh, this is also an intensive area of research and where it also ties into uh, classical computing and supercomputing very much because this already the, the figuring out how to run a program most efficiently in a quantum computer becomes a really challenging optimization problem itself. So comp- compiling a program for a specific quantum computer really starts to already require supercomputing power when, when you have uh, a large number of, of qubits. And now the lights are flying. Great. But we have, we have a few technical problems here today, but let's not that uh, disturb the discussion more. Uh, but but yes, so, so but uh, I think this also shows, shows very nicely why it is important to really merge 
supercomputers and, and quantum computers because just handling these unruly beasts uh, requires lots of uh, taming and, and, and classical computing power. And uh, first to just compile the program to the quantum computer so that it actually has a high probability of of succeeding and running before the computer crashes or before the noise destroys the results or the imprecise control. And and uh, then another a bit related to this, it's not exactly uh, this method that you mentioned, but it is also to then post-process the signal that you get out of a quantum computer. So um, really, uh, the results you get out, so that's in principle, it's a measurement. So it's... Um, can be, can be compared to noise enhancing in, in any other digital media where you can use machine learning to, for example, take uh, a crappy picture with your mobile phone, but then the software inside enhances that picture to, to be clear and and then, then uh, one can overdo it by, uh, of course, getting perfect pictures of the moon and so forth that we have seen in media uh, recently. But, uh, but uh, anyway, the idea there is then to, uh, for example, use machine learning or other more uh, classical techniques for, for really... Uh, getting uh, and digging out the signal from a noisy background and 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 that's also when you when you get the larger one to computer that becomes uh, a bigger and bigger classical processing problem and that's why one really needs this tight coupling between supercomputers and quantum computers constantly if you had to make an educated guess do you believe that the the progress in the near future will come more from hardware optimization or making the quantum computers behave more stably or software optimization that in essence we're just able to filter the the results in a more meaningful way i would say that progress in both is very rapid for the moment and i really need both so so just improving the hardware will get you there at some point but uh, then you can really accelerate this point and and you, when when you actually get some useful results out of a quantum computer by also developing the right software and that that includes them both developing the quantum algorithms themselves uh, that use this superposition and so forth to perform a calculation but then also this support software that uh, really mitigates the noise and and then filters out the signal from the noise in a classical manner and so forth so so it, it is a combined effort and uh, both are equally important and uh, I would not dare to say which one so in the near term will be more more important because uh, really for the moment the progress is, is so rapid on both fronts and uh, that's really also needed to to get quantum computers in, into the useful regime sounds really promising and uh, of course it's not like a mutually exclusive choice luckily so no, so no, both that, can be no, optimized no. Uh, there there is actually uh, I, I think one needs to do this hand in hand also uh, the software needs to understand the hardware uh, and really understand the how a specific quantum computer works uh, to be able to really optimize it and so forth. So, so it's also not separate tracks of of improvement, but but one really needs discussion between both the software and hardware developers. A wired journalist, on the other hand, went as far as stating that due to the slowness and inaccuracy of current quantum computers, they are useless. What do you think about this? Well, it depends on on how you define useless. Uh, I would say that forgetting any sort of uh, calculation that you are doing currently on on your laptop or your supercomputer done faster presently quantum computers are useless for this task they will not do it but uh, one is developing that uh, capacity and capability and and at, at some point uh, we will get there uh, so it's not useless in the way from from this perspective that it's of course intensive research and that's uh, useful in itself and but uh, it's right in the way that, uh, yes, right now you cannot use a quantum computer to speed up your calculation. But uh, there's also other types of things one can do on a quantum computer that are not directly related to calculations. So so calculations, faster and more efficient calculations might be some five, ten years ahead in the future. But already now I can use quantum computers to do a completely new type of science. And uh, there's been in the news lately, for example, the creation of time crystals on quantum computers, uh, on the quantum processing units themselves, where one actually uses the the quantum computer as a highly controlled physics lab, because uh, uh, you really have these quantum states there, there that uh, 
normally are very difficult to control and handle. And But quantum computers are really, uh, they are built uh, and uh, their whole purpose is to control quantum states as precisely as possible, because that, that's what you want to do. You want to control these qubits uh, with high precision. But uh, the original idea was to use that to do computations, but we can also do other things with them, because now we really can use it as a, as a physics lab and and then these time crystals that are then like these uh, periodic structures that repeat in time instead of space, like normal crystals, uh, uh, is a, one example of what one actually has prepared on a quantum computer uh, or the processing unit. And, and another one was there at the end of last year, rather controversial maybe, but, but still an interesting concept was to create a wormhole on the QPU. So in this case, one, one really uses the quantum computer to create something that hasn't existed before, a physical phenomenon that just pops up on the actual quantum computer or the QPU because you can control it very much. And it is uh, already now is really being used to, to do uh, new types of basic research. So, so I would say that they are far from being useless. So would you say that to properly manage the general public's expectations on quantum computing, going back to the terminology itself, maybe just using the same word or term computer as in classical computing, that itself is causing a lot of these mismanaged expectations? Maybe, but then again, that's something that you cannot really avoid. You, they are still quantum computers, and that is what their main purpose will be in the future. So, so I, I don't think we can get away from this. But, but uh, managing expectation is actually really important. And, and uh, but the, I would say hype in the field is perhaps um, at a reasonably high level, uh, <laughs> to put it widely. But um, I think that's also quite natural, just because it is an exciting technology, and that happens with practically all new technologies. A lot of news around quantum computing from the past five to ten years has focused on how current web encryption methods will become obsolete in the age of quantum computing. Could you explain this? Yeah, so this is actually one of the maybe most famous quantum algorithms uh, in the, in, for, for the moment. And that's, uh, it's, so it's based on Shor's algorithm. Peter Shor, inventor, published uh, this, uh, this in 1994, and uh, it's uh, a method for factoring large integers into their prime number uh, constituents. And uh, this might seem like, okay, yeah, cool. So what, but uh, actually this is a mathematical problem that most of the uh, asymmetric encryption, uh, this public key encryption uh, is based on, and uh, that's then what is used in online banking and, and web tra traffic for the moment. and. Uh, so no, this comes from a mathematical fact that multiplying two integers with each other is really simple. Uh, no matter how large they are, like a normal computer really quickly can solve this problem. And uh, But the reverse problem, uh, finding out from a large number which two integers was this uh, product of, is extremely hard. And um, so much of uh, modern day encryption is based on this asymmetry in uh, in this uh, mathematical problem that it's easy to multiply two numbers but then after that multiplication figure out if you don't have those two numbers what were they is very difficult and for example this RSA 2048 uh, which is uh, one of the most most used encryption standards for the moment uh, uh, at its core it's based on multiplying multiplying two integers that are about 300 digits long to produce about a 600 digit long uh, number uh, and relying on that the reverse engineering of this after you only transmit the 600 digit long number uh, will be impossible for modern computers to crack and it is true so uh, like a even the most powerful supercomputer would take several times the age of the universe to to really try to figure out the uh, prime number factors of a 600-digit long number. Uh, but uh, what Peter Shor then showed in 1994 is that if you would have this quantum computer that still then was a theoretical concept, uh, then also the reverse problem would be really easy to solve. And this really is based also on this massive parallelism that 
that the quantum computer can provide through superposition and, and entanglement and so forth. And uh, this really maybe also served as, as a wake-up call for uh, many uh, actors uh, around the world. Uh, it uh, showed really the latent power that quantum computers can have when they are sufficiently mature, but it also then, of course, showed the threat to en en encryption as, as we know it and as we use it to a large extent these days. So uh, it is uh, definitely uh, a real thing. Uh, for the moment, we are still very far away from having quantum computers that would be powerful enough uh, to really pose any sort of threat to to, to factorizing. Uh, you, it has been estimated you would need about 20 million qubits to do this, 20 million noisy qubits, and now we are at the stage where, where one is developing a thousand qubit processor. So, so we are in a way quite far fr fr from it still, but uh, uh, we are getting there. And we should remember that uh, and keep in mind that how long do we want our secrets to stay secret? So there is already this uh, suspicion that that uh, the many actors are just downloading encrypted information now just to decrypt later. Uh, and uh, of course, if you have information flowing around the internet that you would like to uh, be kept secret for, let's say, 20 years, 30 years, some medical data, uh, or even then state secrets, if you go to that level. So so, so uh, we really are at the stage when one has to start to transition to quantum-safe cryptography. So one, we need to change the encryption algorithms that we are using, uh, just in case uh, the quantum computers become ready quicker than we thought, uh, and even if uh, it would take this 50 years even before before they are ready. So, uh, yes, it's a real problem and it has to be tackled. But uh, I would say for normal people, it's not that urgent. That's something that we have to do at infrastructure level. But it, it is a big process, just uh, changing all the routers in the world to be able to handle new algorithms. So, so for example, this uh, quantum resilient or post-quantum algorithms so they do exist already but they have not been completely standardized yet and and uh, so there there is uh, a long administrative process already into getting some new encryption algorithms that deployed all around the world so it's it's a work that has to be started now and um so it, it's uh, definitely a real thing it's really interesting and you know how some inventions kind of just come as a surprise, somebody invents it, and it has a disruptive force. But this horizon has been kind of, we've been going towards it for the past decade or even longer. We've seen it, uh, and we know that there's this kind of horizon coming up that, that could break modern encryption, but then we just don't know when it happens or, or when we reach that horizon. Yeah, yeah, you know, is, that, that is, that is uh, I think, also a problem for, for actually getting uh, now your act together and start doing something is that it's sometimes in the future. So, so in a way, it's a bit similar to this uh, Y2K bug, the year 2000 bug. Yeah, but, but that was much simpler because then you had the definite deadline. You had to have it ready by the uh, 31st of uh, of uh, December 1999. Uh, otherwise, your computer system broke the next day. But but here, where well, there's no definite time, so then it is maybe too easy to do. Okay, let's do it next year instead of starting now but um, it is a challenge and it, it is also just this uh, in a way a mental challenge for for getting oneself to really the drive to okay now we have to do this but uh, th that's also why, why it probably needs to come from uh, from just a higher level that s someone puts in place that now all the banks have to change their encryption methods so it, it has to come from le legislation because yeah. uh, of course many many are already exploring this and uh, starting to implement it and there are products um, that uh, use this, but um, but uh, really this final push of no, 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 now we just do it because it's something that has to be done anyway. So, and the sooner we do it, the better. Some say we are already a bit too late, considering this that that uh, some encrypted information should stay encrypted for a long time. And uh, so we so we really just as a society, technological society, we we just need to just change the algorithms more just future proof ourselves and and that comes from regulation rather yeah. than commercial interest maybe on the short term at least and it's probably the kind of invention of that 
weight and importance that there's argumentation that if state actors were the first to achieve this, the general public wouldn't even have awareness that this point has been reached, right? So there's incentive to also then maybe keep keep this to to some level of secrecy to have a, a competitive edge, or what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's maybe a bit exaggerated because it, it will anyway, it will not be a step function where you suddenly have a quantum computer that can break encryption. So, so the technological advancement is is rather steady, and of course, it can accelerate and decelerate over the years. But, but, but it's not that the, we are now missing this one component that will create this very powerful quantum computer. So we have to increase the fidelities, we have to increase the qubit count and so forth. So it's incremental uh, improvements over time until we have this device then that is sufficiently powerful to break uh, the encryption methods that are used today. But before that, they will uh, break lesser encryption methods that were used before, like uh, RSI, RSA 1024, for example, and we'll switch to higher bit count there also just to make it more secure. But but it will be gradual, and um, of course, some some uh, state research organizations might be a bit ahead. Let's say they are one or two years ahead of of the public or, or publicly known research. But uh, but it's not that they suddenly made an invention that uh, is a key to yes, all yes. encryption at uh, once. Exactly. So, so I think we don't have. But uh, what could happen is, of course, then on the software side that someone comes up with an algorithm that is uh, more efficient than Shor's algorithm. So so. We should also remember this, that the, we can come up with a completely new algorithm that doesn't require a massively large quantum computer. And that would then be a step function if we suddenly come up with a theoretical method that needs less resources, uh, which would mean that, okay, uh, now suddenly we actually had that, as I mentioned. So there was this study that that uh, claimed that one needs some 20 million qubits uh, to break RSA 2048. But let's say someone comes up with an algorithm that only requires 10,000 qubits then that's, of course, a big jump in what resources are needed. A more mathematically elegant yes. way to approach the, the problem. Yeah, or, or it could, for example, also be an algorithm that doesn't work as reliable as Shor's algorithm. So uh, Shor's algorithm can, in principle, factorize any integers, but uh, one could come up with a method that, that decrypts, let's say, 1% of the secret messages uh, efficiently. But 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 of course uh, that already would break encryption because you cannot trust it anymore if if ninety nine percent of the messages are safe but the that, that's not sufficient yeah, yes the yes. likelihood of somebody yeah. being able to brute force yeah. open the encryption yeah. then rises so I, I would say maybe the the worry about someone hiding the progress is, is more on the algorithm the software side uh, than on the hardware side. Because there, there, on the software side, you really can. You just come up with it's like with normal hacking. So you come up with some exploit uh, on the software side uh, that you can that, that you can use, and you don't uh, necessarily build larger, larger supercomputers to crack uh, secrets from from your competitors, uh, be it companies or states. But you come up with uh, software methods to break into systems. And uh, in a similar way, I, I would see that, that also for quantum computers, that one comes up with a more efficient algorithm for breaking encryption. But uh, let's hope anyway that the main uh, main application field, fields will be to come up with the algorithms that solve some useful problems more efficiently. So lastly, who would you like to know more about Helmi and quantum computing? Well, I think everyone should have uh, some sort of uh, at least... Uh, idea of what quantum computing is about just to see what where the field is going in these days and and uh, because it will have a rather big impact on society as a whole and then then it's good to have at least heard about what all of this is about but uh, to be more precise so uh, especially about Helmi so uh, anyone who would like to use a quantum computer especially within Europe because it's uh, a European machine for, for the moment uh, should try to get access but uh, in general try to get access to any quantum computer. One can, uh, one can access quantum computers online from your web browser already now. So IBM, for example, is providing this and, and Quantum Inspire in the Netherlands uh, provides access to just about anyone who just happens to be online on the internet. And uh, I think playing around and, and running your first uh, quantum algorithm on a real quantum computer is is 
an exciting moment and uh, it might not look like much. Uh, you might have a command line that says that uh, now uh, qubit uh, zero has value one and qubit one has value zero, but uh, it uh, still, when one thinks of what one has done, so so it's still something that uh, in principle was worthy of a Nobel Prize last year. And uh, now you can do this uh, manipulations of the quantum states sitting on your sofa in front of the TV, but, uh, well, looking at your laptop remotely controlling a quantum computer. What a time to be alive, right? Exactly. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. And hope to see a lot of new things from Helmi and quantum computer in the future. I'm sure there will be lots of exciting news. Thanks for tuning in to the interview. Let me know what you think about the development of quantum computers. And remember to like and subscribe to the Future Here channel to hear more interesting interviews about science and technology that can shape the future of humankind. Until next time, bye.